We're doing something different this time. This is something I have an interest in and was offered a review copy, so I get to talk about it. That's right, we're covering a book this time. Press Reset by Jason Schreier. If you've spent any time reading about video games the last few years, you should be very familiar with that name, along with leaking many unannounced games. He's written such hits about toxic work culture and games development during his days at Kotaku, like Inside the Ghosting Racism and Exploitation at Game Publisher Nicalis, and How Bioware's Anthem Went Wrong. These days, he writes about the games industry for Bloomberg. I've always been interested in what it takes to make a work of art, and make no mistake, even the trashiest games are art. I listen to film commentaries, watch the behind the scenes making of features, but for video games, all we really have is YouTube documentaries that are mostly recorded after the fact, and none of them talk about the elephant in the room, the publisher. Press Reset covers the systematic destruction of well-known studios through years at the hands of executive decisions and creators being too niche to make the money demanded of them from higher-ups. At least, that covers most of the stories in this book. Among that we have some developer history to dig through, and much like Schreier's previous book, Blood, Sweat and Pixels, Press Reset does go into the production history of a few of the games that prefaced some of the studio's downfalls. But primarily, we follow the lives of specific developers, their struggle with burnout, and their growing dislike of the unsustainable AAA development machine that chewed them up and spit them back out again. We follow their attempts to make a new life after a studio shuts down, and Jason pays particular attention at the end to finding a way to fix these problems. The stories are told in a springy, succinct prose style that I don't think really prepares you for how rough some of these people have it, but the book is written so people who don't even have an interest in video games understand what's going on. I suppose this isn't true crime, but the events through the 38 Studios saga were a point I really felt exhausted by a struggling descent. I'll get to that later. Right now, I want to touch on the content of each chapter, give you an understanding of where this book goes. If you're going to get the book based on my recommendation and want to go in blind, a lot of what's covered throughout this book should be familiar over years of press releases about studio shutdowns. It just digs a lot deeper than a press release would. But just in case, you can skip to this timestamp for a dramatic outro. Unlike Schreier's previous book, a lot of the chapters in this book chain together as events cascade into the downfall of multiple studios, and we begin with something I didn't expect at all, a brief history of Warren Spector's career, beginning with his time with Richard Garriott's studio Origin, becoming a household name with Deus Ex, his dream deal with Disney, and finally into Other Side, Spector's current studio that had so many teething problems I don't think anyone is convinced they're still going. There's a lot in between all of that, as every studio Spectre has ever been a part of has shut down, nine times out of ten by the huge corporation that bought them deciding they didn't want them anymore. It's the most insightful chapter of the whole book, told from Spectre's perspective. There's so much history in there I never knew, like Ken Levine and Spectre working together at Looking Glass Studios, or Spectre having a hand in every game leading up to the solidification of the immersive sim genre through Deus Ex. As a weird side note, I recently saw someone talking about how Spectre likes the smell of his own farts and never let go of his success with Deus Ex 20 years ago, but this book tells the story of a man who let that game go very quickly. He knew that because he made one successful game, publishers would want the next to be 10 times as such, something he understands is impossible. He knows he's capable of finding an audience for his games in the millions, but has no confidence he could build that audience to the tens of millions. Personally, I think he sells himself short, but I understand this point of view after he spends years struggling against the tide of big publishers. The next chapter, or I should say, string of chapters, concerns the end of Irrational Games, the studio behind Bioshock. We also follow the effects it had on one of Take-Two's other studios, and a studio that rose from its ashes, 
The first chapter concerns Irrational itself, the development hell Bioshock Infinite went through, and Ken Levine being so tied to the studio that his attempt to leave destroyed it completely. Video games struggle with the concept of auteur theory, but the production woes and subsequent closure really solidified Levine's importance to the whole company. This event was, however, very public, and the chapter mainly goes into the attitudes of people leading up to the closure, the secrecy, and the hope to find a future. The next chapter follows the development team that spun off Irrational Games to pursue the independent market. For a while, there was a slew of Kickstarters pitched as being produced by former Irrational developers, and the Molasses Flood is one of them. This ends up being a story of struggling to make it work, while trying to make sure everyone was on equal footing. That studio still stands today, but you'll have to read the book to find out what saved them. The final chapter in that saga is the tale of 2K Marin, an Australian studio that struggled with its identity, and despite not having a single employee work there for years, 2K Games never officially announced its closure. This was the team saddled with production on the first-person shooter XCOM Declassified and treated as irrational sister studio for the period Ken Levine was attached to the project. That game was stuck with so many production woes along with a sequence of cut costs. The amount of jerking around that was done to the team just felt like demise was inevitable. So, when we eventually move off the irrational saga, we turn to Visceral Games, once known as EA Redwood Shores until they made a little game called Dead Space and gained their own identity. At least for a while. Visceral's downfall has been well documented over the years, such as Dead Space needing to include multiplayer and be less horror, more action for wide appeal. Actually, around the time I was reading this chapter, EA admitted it's surprised that Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order was successful for a single player game. And this was 10 years after announcing they had no interest in making single player games anymore, which was a big reason for the shift in Dead Space 2 and 3. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the last exclusively single player game EA developed in house was. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 2 in 2011? Ugh. Well, Visceral soon becomes a team that has to pivot harshly when put on a Battlefield title, and then again when put on a Star Wars title. While this is a story about Visceral being shifted too much and suffering most of its existence, it's also a story of one man experiencing and adjusting to all of this until Burnout won in the end. Following Visceral, we have the, um, Amalur duology? Let's call it that. First following 38 Studios, the developer started by former Major League Baseball player Kurt Schilling. Through this, we experience a story of high quality studio life and horrific mismanagement. There's so much of this story that's public and it even had an aftermath that isn't covered in this book. I'd say the first thing anyone would know about 38 Studios was the effort put in to hire massive talent like Todd McFarlane and Ore Salvatore. But Schilling's approach to managing a studio was more about celebrity status than getting things done, so you can already see where it started to go wrong. Needless to say, the World of Warcraft killer that was promised never came out. Not because it was stuck in development hell, but for a single sentence spoken by a Rhode Island governor. Secondly, we follow Big Huge Games, the studio behind the Kingdoms of Amalur game that did come out, Reckoning. Originally entirely separate from Amalur, 38 Studios bought them out and the game became another part of Schilling's doomed fantasy universe. This is the story of a swifter collapse and struggle against 38 Studios' greater shadow, despite the success of the game they just released. It took a while to get through these two chapters as ultimately, no one got out without massive loss and reading it all unfold was incredibly stressful. The last studio we follow is Mythic, which presents us with an interesting story of a pre-World of Warcraft MMORPG studio forced into mobile game development, with understandably disastrous results. 
We follow through the development of Dungeon Keeper Mobile, and how deluded executives had no idea what they were asking of the studio, mandating so many decisions because they wanted to directly copy Clash of Clans monetization mechanics, rather than what made people want to play it. Famously terrible, the studio was closed for it. The story doesn't end there though, as we follow two developers who were laid off, and found more hope in the indie market than the Molasses Flood did, even if they did kind of learn the same lessons through it. In the last chapter, we acknowledged some potential solutions. I shouldn't get in deep here, but we revisit some old faces from earlier chapters, and after all the hard times, we see how they managed to move on, and what alternatives they pursued to fight back against an unsustainable system. Video games are a medium with a huge human cost that's largely forgotten about by the public, at least until they don't like a game and decide to send death threats to the exhausted, burnt out developers for it. A medium where a huge publisher could be under investigation for numerous abuse allegations, but they're releasing some new games soon and we get to watch some trailers for them, so let's sweep whatever complaints people have under the rug so gamers don't get bothered by them. A medium where production enters crunch so much that management thinks it's the secret to making good video games, but historically, studios that crunch continuously show a large decline in quality and general playability in subsequent games they release. A medium that seeks to follow slightly successful trends, forces studios to shift mid-production and ultimately shut them down to avoid having to own up to their own terrible decisions. Press Reset seeks to pull the veil over all that. Well, not specifically all of that, but it wants to shed a light on what those events can do to people, where it leads them, where it leaves them, and why things need to change.